When's choir practice start? Not this Friday, but the following? It is this Friday? A week from Friday. Okay. Well, your singing reminded me, Ruth. You such a, have such a lovely voice. And uh, if any of you think you're too old to sing, uh, <laughs> obviously that's not true. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I better get with the subject, otherwise we'll be out of time, my horse and around. This is my third and final of the series on the uh, topic of the kingdom of God. I talked about the mystery of the kingdom, uh, the kingdom and the church, and today the ethics and the kingdom. For the benefit of those who didn't get the orientation of the first one, let me just say a few words of orientation. Uh, the messages of Jesus were concerned with the kingdom of God. This is ultimately entered when Jesus come to fetch those who have believed in him at the end of this present age. The kingdom being entered is of eternal duration. Mysteriously, however, that kingdom reaches back to the time of Jesus' first ministry upon the earth. Jesus called persons to enter that kingdom in due time, and they became members of his little flock. Much later, that little Jewish flock took on gentle, Gentile members, and in times, the Gentile members redefined what the church was, and more close to what we know it today to be. The church is not the kingdom, but it witnesses to the kingdom by its preaching, by doing good works, especially those concerned with healing, and by members living righteously. And that leads us right into today's topic about the ethics. And I plan to proceed this way. Well, tell me, tell you how I've already proceeded. I proceeded to look up the word kingdom of God and find uh, ethical teachings which were connected with those teachings in particular. And that's what I'm going to highlight today. Not all of them in the Bible, but particularly from the rich collection in the gospel according to Matthew. And then I'm going to also say some things uh, that come uh, from uh, Paul's writings. But I'll be emphasizing uh, what was said in the writing of uh, Matthew. And I don't expect any um, great catalog of teachings. What we're going to be looking at today is, I think, a series of jewels laid out on the counter that uh, we have pulled here and there from the scriptures. And it's for that reason that I have provided in the bulletin the scriptures that i am be using today. And then maybe next week sometime, have a quiet moment, and you can look up those scriptures, and think back upon the sermon, and perhaps have another blessing in your life, I hope. All right, now we're going to have on the screen uh, some um, of the scriptures, and all of the scriptures this morning are going to be uh, taken from the Revised Standard Version. However, if you listen carefully, you'll find that what I am saying from the pulpit is not reading the words on the screen. <laughs> I hope that won't confuse you too much, but I'm particularly fond of my own translation. And uh, I think it brings out some points. So that's what I'm going to do. And the first one is the Torah text is to be unchanged until all is accomplished. 517 and 18, focusing on that. Think not that I've come to loosen the Torah and the prophets. I've come not to loosen, but to fill up. For truly I say to you all, until it all might be passed away, the heaven and the earth, an iota, one, or one horn, not it might pass away from the Torah until all it might happen. Where I have translated loosen, many have translated abolish. Loosen is a technical term 
of uh, Jesus' age, which means that the commandment is no longer binding on one. It's not constricting one. It's been loosened. You don't have to pay attention to it any longer. And what is in view by the full reference to the words Torah and the prophets is the canon of scripture that was known at that time. It would be another century before the writings were added to the law and the prophets or the Torah and the prophets. Now Jesus is asserting that he is not changing the commandments contained in the scriptures. They are binding upon his followers. Now you and I, of course, know that in time the Gentiles who were in the church did not regard the ceremonial laws binding upon them. Well, this makes sense because Jesus is here addressing Jewish followers as was Matthew in his gospel. More important, perhaps, is the reason for keeping all of these scriptures intact. They have yet to be filled up Others say fulfill, but fill up is what the text says. And Jesus is saying there are events yet to happen which you will see uh, seem to correspond with ideas and events that you read about in the scriptures. And so for that reason, we don't want them taken out of the scriptures until all of these correspondences have come about. Now, the smallest letter to be taken away is the Hebrew Yod. Looks just like an apostrophe, if you were to see it in, in the text. And I believe it is behind the word Iota. Iota, Yod, Iota. That's a transliteration from the Hebrew into the Greek. Perhaps even more minute, no horn is to be taken away. A horn is the tittle or the small stroke or extension, which helps differentiate some letters from some others, like the base from the cove. It looks like a backward C, square C, and yet on the lower right side, there's just the slightest extension. That's the tittle or the horn. Two different letters changes the meaning of the words. That stuff's got to stay in place. All right, second, the commandments are not to be relaxed. 519. Whoever then he might loosen one of the commands, these the least ones, and he might teach thus the men, least he will be called in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever he might do and he might teach this way, great he will be called in the kingdom of heaven. Here we particularly note the fact that the commandments of the scriptures have relevance to one being in the kingdom of heaven. One who keeps these and teaches these to others is to be praised, and the one who does not is to be put down. Third, the righteousness of those in the kingdom of heaven must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. This is in Matthew 15:20. For I tell you that unless it might surpass of you all the righteousness more than that of the scribes and Pharisees, certainly not you may enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the righteousness of the Pharisees in particular is being criticized. The point is not the standards must be higher, although some think that is the meaning here. The point simply is Pharisees have failed to keep the standards. In Matthew 23, 2, which is not on the screen, uh, you can find this. Upon the seat of Moses they sit, the scholars and the Pharisees. All then whatsoever they may say to you all, do you all, and observe you all. But according to the works of them, do not do you all. For they say, but not they do. Now, let's turn to the six hedges. The scripture is found in Matthew 5, 21 to 45, and I'm concentrating uh, on just a bit of that, and uh, it needs to be interpreted as hedges about the Torah. A scholar named Davies has expressed it well, and let me quote from him. 
Rabbinic Judaism evolved from Pharisaic Judaism and taught it was wise to establish a hedge about the Torah. This phrase derives from the imagery of a garden. And I would think, aside, uh, I think of the Garden of Eden when I see this figure being uh, constructed. Suppose a law exists forbidding one to eat the fruit of a certain tree. It would be possible to live in the garden and not eat that fruit, but temptations might arise if the tree were always right nearby and always easy to reach. Suppose a gardener, determining not to eat that fruit, plants a thick hedge, bush by bush, all around the tree to wall himself away from it, so that even to come near the tree, he would have to push and hack his way through the hedge. Once the gardener plants the hedge, he has decreased the possibility of eating the forbidden fruit. He is no longer near to it. He has made a hedge he chooses not to cross. But if he crosses it, he has not broken the law. He was determined not to break. Rather, he's broken through a hedge, which he himself created. So that's a pretty good uh, kind of a device to make sure that one does what's right. If you can make a hedge around what you don't want to do, so you don't do it. Now, he gives an example under the rules of the kosher. The Torah not to be broken is do not boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. Did you know there was a scripture in the, that said that in Exodus 23? Don't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. If it's its cousin's milk, it's all right. I would assume, I mean, just reading it literally. Well, regulations came in to hedge about that law. So let's see how they built those up. Do not boil the meat of any baby goat in the milk of any mother goat. Do not boil the meat of any animal in the milk of any animal. Do not cook milk and meat together in any way. Uh, do not mix milk and meat in any way. And today, many Jewish families have separate dishes, separate sinks, and separate refrigerators for milk and meat. The likelihood of them breaking the law is nil, I think. And these practices developed after the time of the New Testament, but they illustrate what was uh, a way of thinking already in New Testament times. So now let's look at Matthew 5, 21, 45. Uh, there are about six little parts to this. And we'll look at the key part of the text. And then I'll make an interpretive statement uh, uh, relative to that, how, how it works as a hedge. So the first one is on murder, uh, which would be uh, 21 following. We need to back up, sir. You thought I talked so long, I must have covered that subject. Ah, very good. You all heard that it was said to the ancient ones, not shall you murder. But I say to you all that everyone, the one being angry with the brother of him, one being held liable he will be in the judging. This means if you earnestly strive never to be angry, surely you will never commit murder. Now the next one, adultery, verses 27 following. You all heard that it was said, not you all shall commit adultery. But I say to you all that anyone who is looking at a woman toward the coveting her, already he has committed adultery with her in the heart of him. This means if you earnestly strive never to look lustfully, surely you will never commit adultery. Next one, adultery part two, 31 following. It was said, whoever he might send away the wife of him, let him give her a document of repudiation. But I say to you all that, Anyone who, setting apart the wife of him, except it be a case of sexual immorality, he makes her to commit adultery. Well, I need to comment now that in that ancient society, which was very patriarchal, and the woman was hard, lucky that she had something to hold on to at all. The woman could probably not survive except that she 
became married to another man. So if the first one divorced her, what was she to do? You get the picture? Well, if she did, in the view of Jesus, that would be adultery. And Jesus is here putting the onus on the husband not to put his wife in such a position. Hence the hedge. Do not divorce men your wives. Interpretation now. This means that way you will not be the cause of her committing adultery. Next one, false swearing. 33 following. Again, you all heard that it was said to the ancient ones, do not be ones swearing falsely and be ones discharging to the Lord the oath of you. But I say to you all, not be one swearing at all. And this means if you don't swear any oaths at all, it'll be impossible for you to break an oath. Get it? Next, 38 following, excessive retaliation. You all heard that it was said, an eye in return for an eye and a tooth in return for a tooth. But I say to you, not you are to stand against the evil person. Some one, you he slaps on the right jaw bone, turn you to him also the left. This means if you do not seek revenge ever, you will not ever try to get more revenge than the law permits. By the way, the law does not require that if you lost an eye, you must take an eye in retaliation. What it means is you can't do more than that. You can do less. Uh, the last one, be careful always to love your neighbor, 43 following. But you all heard that it was said, you shall love the neighbor of you and you shall hate the hated one of you. But I say to you all, love you all, the enemies of you all. Well, incidentally, you all simply means plural. If you read it in the English, you don't know whether you means singular or it means plural. When I translate, there's no ifs or ands or buts. It's plural. Now, this means if you work hard to love everyone, even your enemies, you will be far more able to love your neighbor. Sure enough. Now also note, while there is no Old Testament law that says one is to hate one's enemy, it's surely true that men do hate their enemies, and Jesus doesn't think that's the proper thing to do, and I think he's right. Now, reflecting upon these as a group, I think we could see the need of prefixing to behavior the buttresses of attitudes and character. Jesus is focusing upon nipping sin in the bud at the earlier stages of anger, lust, revenge, and love. I believe in doing this, he is actually extending the insight of the 10th of the Ten Commandments, do not covet. If we get our attitudes right and our character developed, we will find it much easier to live righteously. So, my friends, may we give disciplined attention to our attitudes and to our character. Then there's the golden rule found in 712. All things then which you all might wish that they do for you all, the men, thus also you all should do to them, for this is the Torah and the prophets. Uh, first of all, notice that this a uh, brief commandment is regarded as a way of stating the gist of the scriptures. We'll look at a couple more in just a moment of this same uh, sort. Second note that there is this sentiment, and you may not know this, in many of the other world religions and in discussions among representatives of these religions, they are centering on this thought as a basis of promoting bonds across the boundaries of religions. Wow. Three more passages in Matthew. Keep the commandments. Jesus said this to the rich young ruler. If you wish into the eternal life to enter, observe you the commandments. He says to him, of which sort? 
the Jesus he spoke and said, not you shall murder, not you shall commit adultery, not you shall steal, not you shall make false testimony, value the father and the mother, you shall love the neighbor of you like yourself. Jesus has selected for emphasis five of the Ten Commandments and the commandment in Leviticus 19.18. They all have to do with relating with other persons. Surely we must take particular note of these six and strive to observe them. But I can't leave the story of the rich young ruler without getting more to the point of it. The rich young ruler said, oh, I've always done this. Yet he sensed something was lacking in his life, and that's what he'd come to Jesus for. And Jesus simply said, go sell everything you got. Give it to the poor. That'll solve your problem. He went away sorrowful. Wow, I wonder what you and I do. Well, I wonder what you and I do with those things that, in addition to this, Jesus would suggest to us. I hope we would heed him. So let's be alert for what he might say to us. Second, the greatest commandment. A scholar of the Pharisees asked Jesus, Teacher, which commandment is greatest in the Torah? He spoke to him, You shall love Lord the God of you with entirety of the heart of you, with entirety of the soul of you, and entirety of the mind of you. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is similar to it. You shall love the neighbor of you as yourself. On these, the two commandments, entirely the Torah, it is suspended, also the prophets. The first law is found in Deuteronomy 6.5 and the second Leviticus 19.18. Here's my comment. The emphasis in both commandments is upon the doing of love, both toward the creator of the universe and toward men, the highest of his earthly creations. Love here is the word agape, that is doing for another that which is best for that one without expectation of repayment. Simply observing these two commandments, I submit to you, would take both you and I a long way toward the accomplishment of our purpose of living righteously. Third, doing ministry to the needy. The final pericope comes from uh, Matthew 25. Let me zero in uh, immediately on verses 37 to 40. Then they answered him, the righteous one, saying, Master, when did we see you hungering and we fed? or thirsting and we gave drink? When you did we see a stranger and we gathered in, or naked and we clothed? When you did we see being sick or in prison and we came to you? Then answering the king, he will say to them, truly I say to you all, unto someone you all did one of these actions to the brothers of me of the least Thus to me, you all did. Strictly speaking, in the context of the age in which Matthew was written, the least meant a humble missionary making the rounds of the various churches. He is a servant. If one receives that missionary, it is like receiving the ambassador of the king, which in turn would be like receiving the king himself. And such hospitality is important on the part of all of us who belong to the church. But beyond that context, I believe most of us would go further and say that the Lord Jesus will bless us also for doing ministry to the needy who are not members of the universal church. After all, Jesus set the pattern for us, seeking not the ones who were already righteous, but reaching out to those who were not. Insofar as we give ourselves to such ministries, surely you and I are making strides toward being righteous. And I suspect that all of us have already sensed this because we have such enthusiastic support among our members for supporting the hungry through our local food bank. Well, I could stop, but I've given in to you in the past and let you out on time. <laughs> now I'm gonna collect mine. 
we're, go, uh, we're ready to look at Romans. Uh, and I, let's just listen to this. I'm not going to make comment on it. Uh, just let it soak in. Um, all right. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal. Be aglow with the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. I think he was running out of paper and he's trying to make it short. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm going to skip the next one from Romans 13 and the one uh, from Galatians 5. You can look them up and read them. They're, they're this sort of stuff. And you can sense already having heard me talk about passages of Jesus in Matthew, how the ideas of Jesus are echoed in the writings of Paul, the one addressed to Jewish Christians, the other addressed to Gentile Christians. Well, now it's time to quit. And... Um, so I hope that you like the luster of these jewels which I've laid out for us to look at. We're going to put them back in the jewel case now, but I hope later in the week you'll open that jewel case and look at them again. Thank you. For the opportunity to minister in your midst.